I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we begin this morning. Father in heaven, as we come before your throne once again this morning, we are eternally grateful for the gift of prayer, knowing and understanding that as we pray, we come before the throne of the universe. And Lord, today we just ask that again, you would pour out your spirit upon each heart here. I pray that you would fill my heart today and that there would be just nothing in me that would keep you from presenting the message you want us to hear today in the way that you want it given. So may your Holy Spirit attend us. May your Holy Spirit fill this place. But most importantly, may your spirit fill our hearts. And we thank you for what you will do here now, because we ask in Jesus' name, amen. A Massachusetts teen was convicted of beheading a classmate nearly three years ago. You may remember the story, but just a few weeks ago, he was sentenced to life in prison. The judge handed down two life sentences for Matthew Borges, 18 years old. He was only 15 when he committed his crime. What happened? What would make someone commit such a horrendous act? Well, in Matthew's case, his excuse was that he was jealous. He saw a classmate spending some time with his girlfriend. And so those were the measures and the action that he chose to take. His attorney said that Borges should receive the possibility of parole after 25 years, arguing that he was just a child at the time of the murder and has the potential for rehabilitation. The attorney stated, and this is what I want you to listen to carefully this morning, He is not irredeemably depraved. There is hope for his redemption. He can change his life. Now, I don't believe he can change his life, but I believe that Jesus can. And I'm thankful this morning that as we sit here in the comfort of this church, that no matter what it is you or I have done in the past, that Jesus can change our lives. He can redeem us. None of us in this room today are hopeless. But I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever had a bad day? Now, when I say that, I'm not meaning just a bad day. I want you to consider with me, have you ever had a time where you made a bad decision, a bad choice, and you went the wrong direction? You found yourself among the wrong kind of friends. And maybe in some cases it wasn't so bad. Maybe you just found yourself caught up in a situation where the friends that you had found yourself in were gossiping and talking poorly about others around them. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, that those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Maybe your situation wasn't quite that bad, but maybe... You have made some poor decisions in your past. And maybe as you look back on your life, you see that one bad decision somehow led to another. And suddenly you find that your life is a mess. It's not at all what you thought it would turn out like. It's not at all what you had planned. You look back and you wonder, how did I get here? And how did I wander so far from God? Well... I think we understand that in the world that we live in today, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 that wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. We have a broad road that we can choose to walk down and the distractions are many and the distractions are great. And sometimes we can think we're okay when we're not. We're actually headed down the wrong path. That's where I want to pick up our brief story this morning. I want you to go with me to Calvary, a hill called Golgotha, which is described a a hill that somehow had like a human skull shape. 
But yet when we look at the scene on Golgotha, it's almost unbearable to look at. We see three men being put up on crosses. Now, when you go back in time and you think about the movie The Passion that was put out several years ago, I've been told that that movie was so bloody, there was so much things going on in that movie that many people could not handle what they watched and actually got up and left the theaters. I don't know about you, but I don't think I can fully comprehend even just the physical torture that our Savior endured for us. But as we look up on that hill, we see three crosses. And most people would say, well, the two on either side, the two on either side, they were friends of Barabbas. They were companions with Barabbas. And Barabbas was supposed to be the one in the middle, so surely they should have been there. But what about the man in the middle? Why on earth was the man in the middle even there? How could a man that walked around healing people, preaching about the gospel of the love of God, how could a man who had healed so many, who had raised the dead, how could he possibly be hanging in the middle of those two thieves on a cross, having been tortured to where he could barely even make it to the cross? He did it because of love. He did it because he had made a plan before we were ever created that if we made a bad choice, if we made a wrong decision, if we started to go the wrong way, if we would just look up to him, we could turn around and live. Do you think about that very often? This past week, Joni shared with me a, a devotional thought from a book it was called New Morning Mercies, and for the first time I, I read Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 to 26 in a much different way than I ever had. For some reason, it really hit me, the power of what Jeremiah was saying. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. When we have communion service, it's not just a reminder of a sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me. When we have communion service, it is a reminder of a God that has relentlessly pursued His wandering children. He did not give up. He went all the way to the cross so that you and I might have an opportunity. Now the religious leaders looked up at that man in the middle and they said he's right where he belongs. All these false claims about being the Messiah and the Savior and, and all of those things. But yet as he hung there on that cross, he uttered not a word. He doesn't struggle or resist the soldiers who are placing him on the cross. I want you to go with me to our verse for today, but we're going to broaden that uh, passage a little bit. Go to Isaiah chapter 53, and we're going to begin in verse 3, and we're going to read down to verse 12 just so we can see the incredible picture of a Savior's love. Isaiah chapter 53, and we're going to begin in verse 3. I want you to ponder deeply the words that we read together. Beginning in verse 3, it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when he shall make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities." Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. How often do we think about what Jesus went through for us? The price that he was willing to pay, the sacrifice that he was willing to make. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of all of us. Now, we may not be like young Matthew Borges and committed some unspeakable, horrendous crime, or even like that thief on the cross who just got tangled up with the wrong people and didn't stand up for what he knew was wrong. But our passage today tells us that all of us, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. We have all made decisions and times when we have maybe not walked away from God completely, but we have walked in a different direction. And therefore, Jesus had to pursue after us. You know, as I look back on my life, I walked away from God for quite a few years when I was a young man. I didn't commit any crimes. I didn't go out and get all involved in drugs or trafficking or or kill anyone. But I walked away from God. And in that time in my life, I'm thankful that God kept coming after me. And I know that every one of us in this room can look back at a point where you weren't so close to Jesus. And aren't you thankful that even though you weren't so close to Him, that He is always faithful? He is always faithful. No matter who we are, No matter how good we think we might be, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 23, there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This morning, as we partake of communion service for, I don't know how many times it is for you, but as we partake of it today, remember, everyone needs a Savior. There is no one. It doesn't need a Savior. Without His sacrifice on the cross, there is simply no hope for us. Communion reminds us of the price that was paid that we might have hope. Jesus didn't just die on a cross. He pursued us until we either accept or reject. Acts of the Apostles says it was at the cross, that instrument of shame and torture, which brought hope and salvation to the world. Desire of Ages says Christ could have come down from the cross, but it is because He would not save Himself that the sinner has hope of pardon and favor with God. Hope. How many of you here need hope today? 
We all need hope, don't we? Hope is what makes us carry on. You remember in the story years ago about there was a group of people that went climbing up on Mount Everest. It was a large group of climbers, and many of them lost their lives in a storm on the top of that mountain. And there was a doctor that was sitting right next to a man, and they both had pretty much said, we're just going to freeze to death right here on the top of this mountain because neither one of us can move to get down. As he sat there, a huge wind came up, and the man that was sitting next to him was blown away. He has no idea where that man ever ended up. But he sat there on the top of that mountain, almost frozen to death with no oxygen, and the only thing that brought him back to their camp was the hope that he could see his wife and children one more time. The hope drove him to carry on. To walk through that blizzard. And you know they say in the story that as he was walking back to camp, the snow was blowing so hard sideways that as they looked out, they saw this figure coming. They weren't even sure if it was a man. But as he got closer, he had frozen to the point that his arm was frozen out like this. This man was almost completely frozen. And he made his way back to the camp. He had frostbite, he lost his toes, he lost his fingers, he lost his nose, but he saw his family again. It was hope that kept him going. And we have hope today in a world that is so messed up. Every day we hear of something going on that's a tragedy, or someone loses someone they love, or someone is sick with cancer. It goes on and on and on. Families are destroyed. It never seems to stop. But yet, in the midst of it all, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, there is hope. I am so thankful for the cross of Christ. The story of the thief reminds us that it is not what we ourselves can do, but what Jesus did and is doing for us that makes all the difference in the world. We have a part to play, and I want you to note how it's illustrated in Desire of Ages. So listen carefully to this paragraph. When condemned for his crime, the thief had become hopeless and despairing. But strange and tender thoughts now sprung up. He calls to mind all that he has heard of Jesus, how he has healed the sick and pardoned sin. He has heard the words of those who believed in Jesus and followed him weeping. He has seen and read the title above the Savior's head. He has heard the passers-by repeat it, some with grieved, quivering lips, others with jesting and mockery. Now listen. The Holy Spirit illuminates his mind, and little by little the chain of evidence is joined together. In Jesus, bruised, mocked, and hanging upon the cross, he sees the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Hope is mingled with anguish in his voice as the helpless dying soul casts himself upon a dying Savior. Lord, remember me, he says. When thou comest into thy kingdom, quickly the answer comes. Soft and melodious is the tone, full of love, compassion, and power. The words, verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know, people don't like to talk about deathbed conversions. But I will tell you this that Jesus takes any conversion. It doesn't matter when it happens or where. You can be laying there on that dying bed if there's a genuine conversion in your heart. Trust me, you have a Savior that is, is taking you and accepting you. Jesus wants that not one soul would be lost. But through that story, we realize that it's only in Jesus that we will find hope in this sin-sick world. It's only through Jesus that we will find victory over sin. It is only in confessing that we will find pardon. It is only through the cross that we will find hope. 
Acts of the Apostles, page 209 says, Through the cross we learn that the Heavenly Father loves us with a love that is infinite. Without the cross, man could have no union with the Father. On it depends our every hope. From it shines the light of a Savior's love, and when the foot of the cross, the sinner looks up to the one who died to save him, he may rejoice with fullness of joy, for his sins are pardoned. Kneeling in faith at the cross, he has reached the highest place which man can attain. Today, there is hope in the cross of Calvary. And before we go to the ordinance of humility, I want to share with you a song that takes me back to that verse that I read about God's mercies. And you know, Wednesday as I read that, I don't know why, but it was like the Lord was telling me to sit down and write a song. And I sat down and I started writing and I couldn't believe how fast God brought the words and the mellow to me, melody to me. And I want you to really consider the mercy of God, how He has displayed that mercy through the cross, and what it really means to you and to me who have wandered away from God. The title of this song is, That's When Mercy Found Me. I had wandered far away Like a lamb who'd gone astray And the darkness of my sins Closing in Then the shepherd heard my cry He came running to my side And he picked me up and brought me home again that's when mercy found me that's when grace came through that's when jesus did for me the thing i couldn't do he took me from the pit of sin and he claimed me as his own and then he said i love you i love you child come home like a son who ran away i thought i had to go my way I was sure that I could make it on my own But I failed in all I planned Life was slipping through my hands And I found myself hurting and alone that's when mercy found me that's when grace came through that's when jesus did for me the thing i couldn't do he took me from the pit of sin and he claimed me as his own then he said, I love you, I love you, child, come home. That's when mercy found me, that's when grace came through, that's when Jesus did for me the thing I couldn't do took me from the pit of sin and he claimed me as his own and then he said i love you i love you child come home 
Then he said, I love you, I love you, child, come home. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, We are so thankful for mercy this morning. We are so thankful for grace that is so much deeper and stronger than all of our sin. And today, Lord, as we go to the ordinance of humility, my prayer is that we will each one be praying that you will wash us clean and that we will confess anything that is keeping us from being closer to you. But we pray as we come back in here and as we experience this communion service that again we would just remember that it was grace, it was mercy, it was love that caused you to do all that you did and are doing for us. Lord, may that be the theme of our lives. May we understand the mercy of Jesus so that we will extend that mercy to others around us. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts today revealing to us how we can not only come closer to you, but can be a greater reflection of who you are to others. We thank you for being with us now, and we ask that you will continue to be with us as we go into these services. In Jesus' name, amen. Our ordinance of